emailed Catherine. I kept thinking they were like getting lost in the wasteland for Saturday. They're probably like, wow, she really wants to volunteer. Send me good. like eight emails. Yeah. This one's so nice because it goes all the way down. That's the top of my snow boots. Yeah. We bought this when we're in the Duke. So we got in the Duke kind of sitting over my I'm the only one that was warm every night. And you're like, I'm good. You guys, you laughed at my suit once a week for my clothes. Yeah, that's it. I know I saw like one other car in the park. I know I showed up. I thought maybe I do just a minute. No, I was checking my email, but I remember because they end up baker quality, you know, but we're having fun. <laughs> you have to come to class so you can get all the good damn it. Something. Yeah, my friend will text me if she's online. She'll be like, can you grab me one? <laughs> and tonight, whatever reason, you know, I order catalogs from Richter's, so I just think the catalogs amazing. Catherine, are you familiar with Brex? B R E C K S? Yeah, they're a seed repackager. Okay. Or repackager. That's they buy seed and bulk from somebody else and then they repackage it. They don't do their own services, right? So that's one reason why I like to teach out of Johnny's and out of Territorial 
is because they actually pull what they sell. Uh -huh. And they have just a wealth of information in there. They got great customer support. So if you're having problems, you can get in touch with them. And I have so even though it's kind of like skeleton staff up here, we still have like so many interruptions. And <laughs> it's usually the way it's usually the, the days that you think are gonna be really quiet, and those are the days that are just like please can you help me out? Oh, yeah. Well, we'll actually go and make them 
the Defense Department, the Biden administration brought He goes on to say this. Well, it's six o'clock, and so I'm going to get going. And I appreciate all the hearty souls who have come on the call. So I grew up in Wisconsin. And this weather is sort of normal to me. Yeah, well. <laughs> so take one of those and pass it around. And I want you to put your name on it. Because later on, so for everybody who is not here, we will do a raffle for a drip kit. 
So this we'll, and we'll take this some kind of Together. And so this is a great kit for doing like vegetable gardens or flower beds. So it's really good for those that sort of use. So the kit comes with two 100 foot, 15 mil, eight on center, low flow. Tapes. So for all of us, you will work at the farm and ranch show you're going. What's she talking about? Mm -hmm. Also comes with a timer and all the support equipment. And so we will go over that. And we're going to pull it out. We're going to lay it out in the hallway. So I apologize for all of you guys who are on Zoom. I don't think there's enough room to do it in here, but I'll try. And we'll put it together. And then what I'll do is everyone's name is in here. I'll reach in and, and grab a name out. So this is for, and we'll talk more about this when we lay it out, but it's just really ideal for vegetable gardens and that sort of thing. So if you're interested, by all means, throw your name in there. If you're not, there you go. Okay. So did everybody get a, a Richter's herb catalog? So I, I get this catalog because it's just an absolute wealth of information. And if you were to buy a book like this with this much information in it, it would be very, very expensive. So this little catalog, so we'll go to page five. And right at the top, it says Aconite which is monk's hood. And for those of you who are not making class tonight, I'll have catalogs for you to pick up when it warms up and you guys thaw out. It describes the plant. It's a perennial. It's good in zone two through nine. And then there's a bunch of little symbols there and there's keys all throughout. So it blooms in the, this is it blooms in the spring, but I always found my aconite bloomed later. It is poisonous. So it's a plant that you have to be very, very careful with. The stems, the leaves, the flowers, the roots, every part of the aconite is, is poisonous. It's also called wolf's bane. Bright blue flower spikes. It is a very beautiful plant, by the way. Um, Recognized as a poison since antiquity and used on arrows in battle and hunting. Contains acatin, a useful sedative for many conditions, but not to use without medical supervision. And so this is the wine you grow in. It's beautiful. It's pretty. It's a beautiful plant. It really is. And I've I've so grown it. Do yeah. I've grown it. Yeah. It's easy to grow. Get affected by it. No, Ed, I mean, not honey. that I'm aware of. Yeah, okay. Not that I'm aware of. I've not heard Cause anything. Right. Because I've not heard that the nectar is toxic. So that that I wouldn't that I don't know. So yeah. Yeah. And so um green tea, the, the, the plant that you get green tea from, which doesn't grow here. Um is actually the nectar is very toxic to our honeybees. And it's something you need to grow down in. It, it's only grown down in like Florida, Georgia, those areas. When you grew this aconite, then did you like keep it in a special place so that your like dogs and other animals didn't get to it? Oh yeah. You just have that like you separate from it. Yeah. Yeah. And it was one of those plants that I grew it when I lived down in Colorado. When I left Colorado, I dug it up and brought it with me. Oh, wow. Yeah, because I did not want to be owners. Yeah, they would maybe know. <laughs> not 
don't know what it is at all. Oh, look, three plants. Right here. So on page seven, the COPA, I like this, improves mental clarity and memory. The true medical bacopa, not to be confused with the ornamental bacopa, commonly used in hanging baskets. So there's a couple different things you know what you're at. The whole plant is medicinal, nerve, and cardiac tonic with a tranquilizing action similar to resting. So you've got to be careful with some of this stuff. It might improve your memory, but temporarily. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in India, it's used for the treatment of debility, nervous breakdown, epilepsy, hysteria, and insanity. But it improves your memory. <laughs> this is why you tell us not to give any medical advice. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what, what you've done. Yeah, because this it's a fine line with medicinal herbs and culinary and, and making someone really ill. <laughs> so it's so that's why we don't really touch the whole medicinal herb thing. And then uh, staying on page seven, we start with the basils. Basil is so easy to grow. I don't know why more people don't just jump into it. And there's so many different varieties of basil. They're all gonna be annuals. So the British basil where it says withstands cooler conditions. Yeah, well, not in my hair. Um, the Genovese basil is probably the best known basil. And there's the, the bush group. There's basils that come with flavors. So it's, it's really a very fascinating catalog because of the amount of information in it. And while it doesn't go in great depth about how to make tinctures or ointments or anything like that, it does give you an idea of some of the medicinal properties to it. And of course, you know, I mean, most of our medicines have come from herbs. And so it's, it's really quite fascinating to look at this. And you know, there's, it's really kind of eye-opening as to how many different herbs are out there and what, what really is an herb and what's not. This is the tip of the iceberg for herbs. There's other herb catalogs. I think Seed Savers Exchange has lists like twice as many herbs as this cat as Richter's. And there's Mountain Mountain Herb out of California, and that's also a little bit bigger herb catalog. But if you're really looking to build an herb garden, you can buy plants. Already started plants from these people, or you can get the seed from them. And there's some that you only want to buy started plants from. And we'll cover that a little bit more. Well, I just I really wanted to bring this to your attention because it's such an amazing catalog. I mean, anyone who's into looking at herbalism or becoming herbalist, this is a really great place to get going on it. So there is the International Herb Association, and they offer a lot of advice on planting and different herbs that you can get. There are a lot of history behind some of these herbs, some of the medicinal properties, recipes for them. So there's a lot of information on the International Herb Association, but every year they also pick out a new herb of the year, and for 2022 it is the Viola, the beautiful old cute viola, which is the flowers are edible. They're really pretty in a salad. Okay. A botanical viewpoint and herb is a seed plant that does not produce a woody stem like a tree. However, bay laurel is a tree. And those leaves off the bay of laurel is what we use a lot of times for seasoning soups and stews. Herb will live long enough to develop flower and seeds. The Richter's catalog, which is out of Canada, but they do ship here, 200 herbs, 43 different types of basils. I mean, it's just, you would go crazy trying to 
And then seed savers exchange again, let's see the more 350. So there's a lot of different herb companies out there that, that, that have herbs for sale, seed and plants. The Rickers is the only catalog I found that actually talks about their medicinal use and whether they're culinary and how they can use for culinary uses. So, so it's a very cool multitasking. Right. Okay, Tiki Farm Cultures, I think reading this at night is okay. <laughs> Most of the herbs are going to fall into the Laminacea family, and this is the mint family. So when you when you get a hold of a stem and you, you feel the stem, they're going to be round, but in the Laminacea family, they're going to be square. And so you can tell what's what's going to be an herb pretty much off the bat just by the square stem. Comprising about 210 genera and 3,500 species. Plants are frequently aromatic. Many of those plants are used for culinary purposes, also medicinally. The foliage is going to have a smell to it, you know, when you crush it or rub it, you have a, an odor for it. Agastasis has got one called double gold. And it's double bubble and, and it smells like bubble gum. So you rub it and it smells just like bubble gum. So the flowers are going to be quite abundant. They're going to be pretty, usually along the lines of purple, white, um, lavender colors, various shades of lavender to white. Rarely yellow and rarely orange. That's how you get into the um, they just dance his family. And they're going to find the ones. So what to do with them? And this is this is one reason why I started this class. Um, did this is kind of additional to the Master Gardener book. Because a lot of people would come to me and go, well, I don't grow herbs because I don't know what to do with them. I know. It's tragic, but it's true. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about tonight is mostly culinary herbs, almost exclusively culinary herbs. And they're going to fall into different categories. You're going to have your really strong herbs. You're going to have big flavor, rosemary, sage, winter savory. Winter savory's got just an amazing, amazing Herbs for accents, sweet basil, dill, mint, marijuana, tarragon, thyme, those are all going to be kind of little quieter notes in their food. And herbs for blending. So these are herbs that are going to help carry the other herbs and enhance their flavors. Spice, parsley, and These are all herbs. Everything I'm talking about is are herbs that you can grow in the classroom. Mm -hmm. It's not been busy by any means. Um, you can all grow them in your gardens. You can grow them here, outside, easy to do. Aromatic herbs are going to have a fairly pleasant smell. Like I said, the, the agastasis, it's double bubble mint. And it's going to have a very pleasant smell to it. You can make a lot of oils from those aromatic herbs. A lot of them are going to be used for perfumes. Um, we do have a master gardener here, um, Mike Heath, who is growing lavender. And sometime this summer, we'll take a uh, field trip out to his place. He's got a still where he distills the essential oils off his lavender. He makes lavender with essential oil. He also does that with geraniums. I think he's doing it with another plant now too. But there's a lot of things that you can do with those, those herbs, especially where you've got a lot of oils from. So some of the other ones are basil, bay, orge, salad ferment, cilantro, chevelle, dill, fennel. I mean, the list goes on. And, and so there's a lot of potential here. And not only is there a lot of potential, but you can make your own 
seasoning blend. You can make your own herb blend. Has anybody done that? Has anybody grown enough herbs that they can make a blend and, and call it the, the Ken Krantz seasoning <laughs> salad seasoning blend? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's fun. It's fun to do. Yeah. <laughs> so one year I, I went crazy and I had the Richter catalog and I thought, well, 20 different basils. So I grew 10 different basils. And a lot of it. Not a little, but a lot. And my husband wasn't using a Subaru that summer. But you know, in a Subaru, you can put that that seat down and you can have a like station wagon in there. Mm -hmm. I put some blocks, some uh, um, blocks in there. And I put screen on top of that. And I drive my basil inside this car. So I, I just left the window rolled up a little bit. And you know, there's enough air circulation, it was hot enough. And I just drive basil in this car most of the summer. Anyone ever So yeah, it's fun to make your own herb blend. Absolutely. Ornamental, ornamental herbs, huge, huge area. I mean, just huge. Roses actually fall into the ornamental herbs. Rose petals are edible. And right now, right now I have a cat that's eating rose petals. He thinks they're pretty tasty. And, and so the roses, that's all across the color spectrum. They're really beautiful. And then uh, valerian, you can grow that as again, just an angle with your crimson blooms, orange, and chicory. You have got just the most amazing sky blue flowers ever. And I've had hummingbirds come to my porch. And I'll show you some pictures of that when we get in there. But it's, it's also a bee support. So if you've got honeybees or you're just trying to feed the native bees, that is a great plant for those guys. <clears throat> Some of them have got fun foliage that's variegated. So it's like creamy white or and, and green. And so you can get some really pretty different colors of the foliage too. So not only orange, but the foliage can look pretty. And a lot of these you can make your own teas. And I was kind of hoping to whether had kind of cooperated. And, and I think I'm going to try to do um, a field trip later on this summer to try to get Laura up here and do a, a class on making your own tea. So not only can you do the salad special, but you can do the, the, uh, the Matthew blend of tea. So here we really don't touch much about medicinal herbs. 2,500 plants have historically been used for medicine. Only 250 have been investigated. And less than 10% of new drugs coming on the market are entirely man-made. And nearly 80% are derived from plant material. So I talked a little bit about um, valerian. That's where valium came from. So Taxol is also um, responsible to people. We could probably talk a lot more about it. The dark and the big power. Yeah. Yeah, I had a master gardener who I'll joke about all the medicinal plants she had in her yard. And if she was going to have a heart attack, she would call over to the vegetalis and <laughs> her about, right? Yeah. 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 So maybe hurt her too. That's the problem if you have no idea of dosage or anything. No, you don't, know, but. So the herb garden, historically, it's been just horribly horrible. And I do say horribly horrible. So we used to knot gardens, and OT, like tie a knot garden. And so they were very precise, they were very persnickety, they were high maintenance. Oh my gosh, well, that's no fun. So this is the herb garden 
at the University of Washington and it's a medicinal herb garden, we're starting to get down a little bit more towards what we would see or what we would build. But this is what I found pretty typical for an herb garden. And this is here in Cheyenne and it's just, it's just kind of a happy happening little herb garden. And that's totally fine. And you can go in there and you can pick what you want. The bees are happy, not fussy, it's easy. This is on the south side of a brick wall. It's really hot. There are some perennial herbs, Artemisia. It's a perennial herb. Um, they, you, can, you can buy baby mole as a small tree, like a ficus tree, and you can grow it inside, grow it in your house. It's not Whatever, it would never be happy outside. It's like a zone seven. So, but it would make a nice house plant. Uh, bee balm, Menardia, Burnett, Catnip, Chives, Roses, Garlic. I say garlic's perennial, but you know, if you forget and leave that garlic there, it will perennialize. And so it'll just set down roots and it'll bloom every big, big, huge ball like this while um, onions and leeks will do the same thing. Fever cube, demander, lavender. Lavender is a little bit more picky. It wants it dry. And we'll, we'll talk about the growing requirements of these guys. Um, mince, oregano, sage, salvia, winter savory. I've got winter savory to save to winter over for a few years, but it's not long lived. And Sheridan got, got three feet tall. So that was um That was pretty cool. Strictly ornamental, not edible. I'm going to put artemisia back in there. Yarrow, although I have heard of people making teas out of yarrow, there's some medicinal properties to it. Monkshood, belladonna, bethrow, um, vetch, foxglove, geranium, periwinkle. Although Mike makes essential oils out of geranium, I think he does it more for the perfumes. Hey, growing herbs. The one size fits all method of growing herbs may not work. So herbs like back alley soil. They do not want real fertile soil. They don't want fancy soil. They just want plain back alley soil. So don't overlook the soil. If it's a rose, that's a different creature. But for the most part, if you're growing culinary or medicinal herbs and they're just annuals, they don't want fussy soil. They don't want over fertilized soil. If you want full sun, adequate water. Put them on a drip. And we'll talk, we'll lay this out and work with this tonight. So put them on a drip system. Back. Blend the two classes a little bit. This is um, this was made. This was developed by Netafilm, which was an Israeli company, and then John Deere bought them out. And I'm not sure who owns this now, but this is a cool stuff. It comes in 50 foot lengths, and you can cut it and reattach it and work it through a flower garden or a vegetable garden. And it's just, I must have 500 feet of that stuff at home. It's not very expensive and you can actually find that in town and you can find it over at um, Bernard's. So good drainage, no weeds, kind of standard issue in the garden. And mulch. I just mulch mine in with straw or glass, grass clippings or leaves, but you want to keep that mulch pretty simple. Okay, drip is the best. And you, and you want to avoid overhead water. So, so throwing the water up in the air, the sprinkler system thing, you're going to get water on that foliage. And so you could increase fungal problems with the foliage, and that's definitely not something you want to. 
You want to keep that foliage clean. I have done black plastic in the top in the past, but I found that just doing um, some sort of molds like grass clippings works the best. So make your own fertilizer and don't over fertilize your herbs. What's it say? <laughs> Miracle grow. <laughs> I talk about the miracle grow in the goes crazy for it. Or maybe it might be that sun, not sun, but it's sunny. So the problem with over fertilizing your herbs is that they put you you start to lose that essential oil, which is all what the herbs are about, is that oil, is that flavor, that culinary aspect, or that aromatic aspect of it. And so too much foliage and it just gets really tall and rank. I mean, it'll grow. You can force it to grow with, with fertilizer. But you also have a bigger risk for insect problems. So, and basil, especially over fertilized, and aphids go hand in hand. So just double check. Yeah. They really, they really don't want a lot of fertilizer. Catherine, what was the name of this again? It, you know, unfortunately, it's changed so it's it's changed names enough times now that I don't know the name of it anymore other than Metafilm, but it's not called Metafilm anymore. But you can find it in a much neater bundle in Menards, usually in the irrigation system. I think Home Depot is offering it now. I haven't been through Lowe's in a while, so I'm not sure what they've got for irrigation. But that is just. That's just really fun to work with, and we'll kind of play with that a little bit tonight, too. And I'll show you how to hook that up into the irrigation system. Okay, again, they really like that back alley, low fertile soil. And it's, keep in mind, it's all about the flavor. You want the flavor. And that, and that fertilizer just pushes the growth way too much, and you're going to lose that aspect of it. Okay, so some of these you can start, some of them are okay about being transplanted, and some of them are kind of persnickety about it. I usually just direct sow most of my herbs, and I don't really grow them in a transplant because they grow so fast anyway. But you can definitely start basil early and get that going. Cilantro, how many of you are familiar with cilantro? How many of you eat Mexican food? <laughs> You've eaten cilantro. You either like cilantro or you hate cilantro. I can grow it. I don't. And that's genetic. <laughs> it's totally genetic and you'll never learn to like it. Never. This is one where you, you want to try to keep it in a little bit cooler location because it will bolt. And as soon as it bolts to so the flowers and its seeds, it, then it becomes coriander. So as a herb, it's cilantro. As a spice, it's coriander. So you can just do what so that it doesn't fall apart? I usually direct sow it into the soil and then I try to keep it in a little cooler location because as oh, soon as it gets hot, it'll cool. Yeah, I've happened in my last year. Yeah. Way. So you're saying starting in late in the winter, um, how would you start just those little, little growing things, little cubes you put them in, or how, how would you put that? You put it in your tub. If you want to, how, how you start in late winter? How you start? So if I was going to start in late winter, take it out and transplant it, I just get, and, and I probably should bring those in because I've got just a garden shed here full of these little starter trays. But I would just do it with a six pack mm -hmm. and just make my own potted soil and put them in there and water them and just start them that way. Put them in your tub or just, does that be hot? Is the soil at 70 degrees? It always helps to have the soil warm when you see starting. Yeah. And once they're up and running, I try to just keep them a little cooler. So plant, the, these are the ones that should be bought as plants, and you've got to buy them from a reputable place, like like Richter's or Seed Savers Exchange or Mountain Herb. But you can't really trust these. At the, at the big box store, because the big box store is going to sell you the cheapest thing they can get their hands on. And lavender, 
Lavender can take weeks, if not months. Has anyone tried to start lavender from seed? How successful were you? Okay. <laughs> It, it can take, you have to have patience and and just persistence because it can take weeks to start lavender from seed. And then there's no guarantee that it's going to bloom the first year. It typically doesn't bloom until its third year when it started from seed. So lavender is almost always propagated asexual from cuttings. So harvesting herbs. Fresh leaves. More, I like to pick mine early in the morning when it's still cool out. And then you know, once it starts to become hot, then all those oils and everything actually start to travel back down into the roots. And so they're going to be at their peak of flavor when it's cool out. So early morning. And then rinse them off in cold water, drain them thoroughly. And then just keep them in a cool location. Not, not necessarily the refrigerator, but with the basil, especially I'll just put it in a glass of water in the you know, kitchen. And it's and I just pick what I want off of it. And then seed heads should be picked as the color changes from green to brown or to gray. And that's when you know they're ready. You can dill is kind of an exception to that. You can still use dill when the leaf the seeds are green and they're still good. It depends on what stage of growth they're in. Usually I'm, I'm so anxious to get basil in the spring that I will I will gently pull off a couple leaves even when they're this tall, mm -hmm. you know, when they're so tiny and, and, and use those in a salad. Once they start getting a little bit more mature, when they start to bloom, that's when the flavor starts to diminish because now that plant is putting all its energy into the flower and the producing seeds. And so, so the flavor starts to diminish in the leaves. So I'll run around and cut the blooms off. I just take the pruners and just trim the whole lot and get them down. But um, you want to pick them just before they flower. And it depends on what you're growing. So if I'm growing thyme, I'll just cut it and take it inside. Basil, if I'm out in the garden by myself, I'll pull a couple of leaves and eat that in the tomato and make it great. Miles, so, so if you just cut them versus pulling them, will that cut part? And if I had a bunch of cilantro and I literally cut like a whole bunch of it and then it just became like, like is it too? Yeah, so with cilantro, I'll just pick some of the leaves off. I just pull the leaves. I don't, I typically don't cut the whole plant, but I just harvest gently the leaves. Try to leave stuff left to grow. And then at some point, it's going to hold and become pulling it. Yeah, I did that. Yeah. <laughs> so you can dry them, but you don't have to use a car to dry them in. Um, there's regular, you can get dehydrators. And they actually make hanging kind of mesh nets that you can put your herbs in and just hang them from the ceiling and let them dry. Frozen, I, I freeze a lot of basil. I make my own pesto, which is easy, easy to make. Has anyone made pesto? Has anyone eaten pesto? <laughs> so pesto is really easy to make. It's just basil, olive oil, and I take walnuts because Pinion nuts are too expensive. And pinion nuts at Sam's Club are coming from China. So I use walnuts instead. Um, that's pretty yummy for them in a super stew or on your pasta. It's pretty well in that sweet curry, too. Yeah, that's I usually a I made a bunch with um, parsley. Mm -hmm. uh, some are too big yep. rolls, rolls and then parsley ones, and then Ziploc bags that they're frozen in that sweet curry. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. Um, so, 
pesto doesn't have to be just basil. You can you can do your own pesto blend. You could you could have the the Judy blend pesto and that, and uh, that's cilantro and honey. Yeah, that they're both cheese. Yeah. And so you can just I when I make it, I just pack it all in little ice cube trays, freeze it, top it out, individually wrap them, throw them in a freezer bag, and I'm good to go. Roll in them. Once they're frozen, they don't come back out like they were before they were frozen. <laughs> and so they are. When it's fried, um, shelf life is one to two years, depending on how you're keeping them. I like to really thoroughly dry them. I don't grind them up fine, but if they're kind of a coarse grind, and then I put them in an airtight jar and I keep them that way. And they'll last for a couple of years. And the flavor is best when they're stored, stored whole and then crushed just before using. So that's kind of like with your bay moral. If you've ever used bay in soups or stews, you always use the whole leaf for those good flavors after. And then infusing them in vinegar. So you can make some pretty interesting salad dressings just by infusing the herbs in vinegar. And lemon balm is especially one of those that just really, really comes to life and infused in vinegar. And I'm sure, have you done more infusing? Yeah, it's very important. Yeah. So I have a speaker coming up to the Bee College who infuses herbs in honey to get the best of both worlds, the medicinal or the, or the herbs combined with the medicinal use of honey. And so she's going to teach class, an all day class on that, which should be interesting because I've never thought about infusing honey and herbs together. But that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So what to grow and how to grow. Agastaches, this will attract every hummingbird in the neighborhood to your place and it'll attract long-tongued bees. So you're not going to get honeybees to this, but you'll find bumblebees and some other really long-tongued bees to it. Comes in a bunch of colors. I don't find that it's particularly long-lived, so it might live for two or three years and then it just disappears. And this is the one um, called Double Bubble. There's one in this family called Double Bubble, and it gets kind of a couple of them. Anywhere from 18, to, 18 inches to three feet tall. And the flowering range, white, pink, mauve, purple, orange. And there's just a whole rainbow of colors with the egg statues. Average water use, they don't want to be overwatered. And that's usually what kills them is too much water. Full sun, hard shade, well drained soil. It, it can tolerate a lot. It's just a really tough character, but it's unfortunately not terribly long lived. Cut flower arrangements. Leaves can be used in teas or light seasonings. So it's going to have kind of a not a huge flaw of flavor to the party, but um, from an aromatic standpoint, it's really very nice. Anise, this is a this is a fun one, easy one to grow. Annual, one to two feet tall. So anise is what you you know a lot of times they'll make cookies and they'll use anise to, with it, so it has a slight licorice flavor to it. Grows rapidly, crack after all the green frost. And so harvesting the green leaves can cut when the bloom plants large enough. So even if it's a couple inches tall and you've got enough leaves, you can harvest a couple of them to take for a salad. So salad or garnish, seeds and cakes and cookies. And if you drop the seeds on the ground, you will have vegetable leaves. Bergamots. Fun one to grow. This is easy to grow. Comes in colors. And this is this is not the bergamot that is used to flavor world rare tea. This is there are two different bergamots. So this is a different bergamot. And I'm not really sure why. Get back to white. So 
if you look at this, this is a really unusual plant, and that is the leaves are whirled and the flowers are also in this kind of round whirl also. And it'll it'll keep growing. How many of you have grown bergamot from an Okay. So it keeps growing and it'll send out another flowering spike out of here. And so it'll more flowers and more flowers. So it's a pretty cool plant. It's beautiful. It'll attract a lot of hummingbirds and other long term bees. So the flowers, you can pick those and add them to your salad. I have good flavor for that. You can put it in soups. I've had a uh, young girl in 4 H took bergamot and made a bergamot syrup out of it for a 4 H project. Yep. Use that for a beverage. Um, I think she made enough that she made a little bit of jelly, not a lot. Flowers, dried arrangements, essential oil, bergamot, cosmetics. Again, this is not the same bergamot that you put in your tea. That's a, that bergamot's actually from a citrus. Boom. So, how many of you guys grow herbs anyway on a regular basis? What, what are you growing? Parsley, oregano, basil, chives, lovely. Okay. Cilantro, dill, Okay. So hopefully you guys kind of expand out your, your bird repertoire because there's just so many different ones to grow. Yeah, if I went and make your own herb blend and dry them and have fun with them. So balm. Melissa, one to two feet tall. I've never found it to get much bigger than one foot out at, at least out at my place. Distinct lemon flavor. This is one you can infuse in vinegar and make your own salad dressing and have that, that really strong note of, of lemon with it. Um, it says it can be grown in zone four with winter mulch. I've tried. I think you guys will have better luck. Harvest before the plant blooms. This is kind of a standard fare with most herbs. You want to harvest before it blooms. Teas, salads, soups, stews, vinegars. Other multitaskers. Basil. Oh, some of you grow those, so it's a little better to taste. Native to India and the tropic regions of Asia, it's been cultivated for more than 5,000 years. So. This is probably why it's one of the most popular herbs that are out there. Cultivars are often named after the type of aroma that they emit. And there's one called Thai basil that has kind of a licorice flavor to it. It's very distinctive. And when you buy your basil seed, make, again, make sure that you buy it from someone that is being careful about their seed source and seed stock because it may not, you may buy one thing out of a catalog like Rex and think you're getting um, a Genovese and in reality you've just got a different type of basil. So that's why, that's why I kind of, you know, buy out of a catalog that specializes in herbs, whether it's Seed Savers or Baker Creek or um, Mountain Valley, any, any of those places that really specialize in herbs, so you kind of want to be careful with that. Again, not necessarily genetically uniform to the seed company. Easy to grow. Basil is most, you know, really easy, easy to grow. I usually just let sell it in soil. Um, a, lot of, a lot of master gardeners have started in pots and then transplanted outside. Likes the soil temperature around 70 degrees, so it likes its feet warm. And soil pH five and a half to six and a half, so it likes it more acidic than it likes than anything else. And once this guy is off and running, once basil is off and growing, you really have to kind of stay on top of it and, and pinch those flower blooms back and not let it go to flower. And, and that can be kind of daunting because. It wants the flower really bad. Get harvest in the cool of day. Handle it really gently. Cool immediately. So I'll wash it off in cold water. 
and I let it just dry on a paper towel. I put it in a glass of water. And again, basil, huge groups. And you got your genovesity, you got your bush group. The bush group are the ones that stay small and compacted. So for those of you who are growing in containers, that's probably the best place to grow them. Just get the bush group. So uh, the Greek bush basil, I'll put it in with my tomatoes when you're totally lost. It's it's my tomatoes. But I don't know why I did that Purple, a lot of different fun purple ones. The sweet group. Then there's a lettuce leaf one that's just ginormous. And then there's a whole whole group of others. Um, blue spice, Thai, cyan, queen, West African, um, camphor, anise, licorice, chocolate, basil, something. And they typically taste like mainly flowers. Not so sure about the camphor, but goodness. So I am oral. Oralis mobilius. This is this is one that's a, a tree. It flowers rarely, but all of those little leaves, once they're dried, they're not you know we buy them in the containers in the store. They're just dried to death. And when you get them someplace in between, dry but not like a desert, some with a little moisture in there, that's really where the flavor is at. And and it's, it's just amazing to use those in your soups and stews and your flavoring and things for parties. Is it quite true? As a house plant. Okay. As a house plant. Yep. Makes a nice house plant. If, if you can grow a ficus tree, a big ficus uh, big family, you can grow this. Yeah. So you can have your lemon and orange grove in the house, and you can have your culinary grove in the house. Yeah. Highly resistant to pests and diseases. They're used uh, in herbal tea, essential oil from the leaves. So, essential oil from the fruit used in soap making. So, it's a multi caster, which I like that. Okay, forage. Again, beautiful sky blue flowers. I have hummingbirds come to mind. Um, honeybees love this flower. So if you're doing honeybees, this is a good one to have in your garden. It likes a more alkaline soil and it grows, it just grows almost wild out at uh, another master gardener's place out by Gilcrest. Very alkaline soil, pH of like eight and a half soil out there. Loves it, does well in that. But it likes that back alley soil. It doesn't want over fertile soil. Doesn't need a lot of water other than just to get it going and an occasional watering. And then the leaves and the flowers are all edible, although the leaves are kind of fuzzy. Has anyone eaten borage? Yeah, the leaves are leaves like trees. Yeah, yeah. The seeds look like little hand grenades. <laughs> yeah. The leaves are fuzzy. So it's kind of a weird mouthful, but they taste like cucumbers. So you can take borage and the flowers and the leaves and throw them in a glass of water and kind of have a cucumber flavor to it. And then, um, this is one of the few where letting it go to flower is really kind of cool. Calendula. It's just such a beautiful flower, you know, kind of a whitish green to a yellow. Hot marigold is another name for it. Totally untroubled, easy to care for. Not much bothers it. So again, it's an easy, easy one. And the flowers and the foliage are edible. So you can put that in your salad. Beautiful plant, easy to grow. I've known some people will get to go through a winter, but as a rule, it's happy. And again, well green soil. That's it. That's it. Catnip. I do have catnip in my garden. 
images and take over the world. So the oils and catnip, they're finding that the oils and catnip actually make a better insect repellent to mosquitoes and flies than even citronella does. If you own cats, that could be interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so is anyone growing catnip or tried growing catnip? Do we have our plants? Yeah. Are the plants themselves? You need to distill the oils. Yeah. Yeah. It's not easy, right? I have it. It would be a better path. Yeah. 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 And it's great if you've got bees, you could kind of track any of the native bees or honey bees. This is this could be another bee magnet in the summer. So it's a really great plant for that. It's it likes the back alley soil. It just doesn't want full fertile soil, it doesn't want to be over water. It does want, you know, fair amount of water. But I found this point where I just mow it. I stick the lawnmower to it and I mow it. And so it stays short. So you can make it for those. Caraway. Is anyone growing caraway? Is anyone eating and enjoy caraway with their Eating sauerkraut, you're eating caraway. And sometimes it's some of the breaded toppings, and so it has a very distinct green flavor to it. It's fun to grow. The biannual, so the first year you plant it, it's going to come up as this, what's called a basil rosette. And so it's just going to be a little plant that gets about way tall, kind of flat to the ground, and it's just going to have a lot of little flower, little leaves to have a basil rosette. And you kind of look at it and go, Really? But it's the next year that it shoots up this huge flowering stalk right up to here, and then just these um, corium type flowers. It's so almost look like a dill. And that's another one where you, you harvest it when it turns brown, when the, when the seeds turn brown. That's where the flavor is at, not when it's in the ground. But if you drop any on the ground, you will have hair away for quite a while. So the seeds have a warm, aromatic odor and flavor, popular in cooking. The oil of caraway seeds is used in liqueurs. I've used it for baking, put it in salads. If you make sauerkraut, it's a nice addition to make sauerkraut. Does anyone make sauerkraut? Oh, it's so easy to make. Oh my God. Grow cabbage, you should be making sauerkraut. Chamomile. So there's two different types of chamomile. There's the Roman chamomile and the German chamomile. And you can make a lawn out of this, out of chamomile. And you can mow it, you can harvest it. Bees love it. This is another popular plant with bees. Tiny white bees and flowers. It, um, Flowers in June and July, full sun, moderate water. And you can harvest this, you can make your own tea, of course, chamomile tea. You know, it's, it's a tea to help you relax. But it's also used for face creams, um, other beverages, hair dye, shampoos, and perfumes. So it, it has a wide range of uses to it. Chives. This one that it will grow in the cracks of the sidewalk if it could up here. Easy to grow, easy to start from seed, easy to do it from divisions. And this is another one where those flowers are really very flavorful. Most people just harvest the stems, but the flowers have got a lot of flavor to them. So I'll take the flowers off my fives and pop them up and grow them in my salads too. Or whatever else I'm making. So easy to grow. They like to grow in clumps and it can be dug up and divided in those clumps and then make more. I'm trying to make a border of chives. So in my garden, I've got a little bit trying to, trying to convince them to grow in that garden. And then cilantro or coriander. And again, this is, you either love it or you hate it because and again, it's genetic. So I grow it because my husband 
Yeah. It's like beets. You either love beets or they taste like dirt. Yeah. And, and so if you don't like beets, it's genetic. Yeah. Yeah. Like I have a counterpart up in Torrington. and he's like, oh, they taste like dirt. You don't like to eat them. So, anyway. And so again, coriander, cilantro. Cilantro starts off as this wonderful little herb here. And then once it bolts, it goes to flower and it produces those little seeds, it becomes a spice coriander. Okay, I have to take some of my front there. Yep. Put some more and more to it. There we go. Just mow it down. So from Abigail, Kenneth is taking over my crunch bed, but the bees love it. So much we've left it alone. And again, a lot of these things, you know, I know that sounds brutal, but you can just take the lawnmower to the mower. And and they'll recover from that. And, and eventually you can get it from they are only about three inches tall. So, I've really just left it alone, Catherine, because it's also keeping out um, just like regular weeds uh, that are trying to get into that bed because it's it's in between the sidewalk and the curb. Um, so the catnip is doing a great job of just keeping everything else out. So I've just really just left it alone. Well, yeah, it, it's a great plant. It takes over areas that nothing else wants to grow. Yeah, it's wonderful. So dill needs to germinate in sunlight. So a lot of those times where you know you've harvested your dill and some of the brown seeds fall off and you're laying there on the ground, that's all they need is this, they germinate with sunlight. So moist soil and sunlight. So I'm kind of an unusual seed in that respect. Every part of it's edible, the leaves are edible, the little leaves, seeds, everything. But it's also, so grow some for yourself, but also grow some for the yellow swallowtail. Because the larva, the, the butterfly itself, she'll lay her eggs on dill, and then they'll part, then they, of course, um, turn into the larva, and they're really very pretty caterpillars, and they eat dill, they love dill. So it's a support plant for the yellow swallowtail butterfly. So grow some for yourself, grow some for the butterflies and just enjoy, you know, if you see a, cat, a really colorful catapult on there, it's a good guy. Even though it's eating your plant, it's a good guy. Fennel, does anyone have fennel salad or even fennel? Yeah. So, Fennel, I think, has gotten kind of a bad rap over the years, but the bulk fennel is really easy to grow, and it gets it gets it can get huge, but it makes a really good salad. You just chop it up into little pieces, and you can either eat it that way or you can throw it in with lettuce. Should you want to use like root vegetable soup? Yeah. I have uh, a friend who grows it. I shall take the leaves and dry the leaves and use that as a tea. And then, of course, the fennel seed has got kind of a liquid flavor to it. So that has some good uses for it, too. And uh, stems can be eaten like celery, seeds used in cheese spreads, vegetable dishes. I, I just plant it direct. You can grow it. From seed transplant it. it so the, it has this bulb on it, but it has a taproot. And so that taproot, anytime you have a plant with a taproot, it makes it hard to transplant. And so I just try to do it direct sow it. But it's fun to grow. And it it's useful. That whole salad is good. Yeah, absolutely. Hops. So hops. Is anyone growing hops? Does anyone make their own beer? Okay. If you decide to grow hops, you want to grow it in a barrel above ground, preferably. Because what you see above ground is nothing like the monster that's growing below ground. And I mean that monster below ground. 
So there's quite a few people in Cheyenne that you might see blue mineral tubs, blue or blue tub about like this, like this in Cheyenne. So, so there's a few mass prayer point pops that have donated mineral tubs to the cause. Because once it's in the ground, you cannot get rid of it. I have a hops plant. And those are pictures of, of my hops. And I have taken Roundup to it for years. Years, and I have not killed it. And, and it's, it's just like, it, it, I planted it here, but it's coming up over there. And it's coming up over there. So if you decide, I want to make my own hot so I can make my own beer, which is very cool, which is what some of the other master gardeners are doing. Make sure you do it above ground. And, and from Abergale, yes, I have hops. <laughs> yeah. The other, the other tricky thing with hops is they have the, the female cone on it. This, and if for as long as hops have been grown, um, we still don't know when to harvest hops. When are they ripe? And so you actually have to take the cone off. And taste it. So you have to learn what it tastes like, right, and when it's ready to be harvested. And they are prone to quite a few diseases, and they'll start to turn the cones will turn brown, all sorts of things. But for a while, I was raising goats, and I found that the goats would eat the leaves, but leave the cones, and it made it really easy to harvest. <laughs> but that's another conundrum with, within the world of hops: is how do you harvest? The cones off them. It's, it's tedious. And you've got to be able to separate the, the flower or the cone from, from the leaves. So it's pretty labor intensive. And that's why, if you make your own beer, um, hops are so expensive. But it's, it, it's a really interesting plant, especially from a medicinal standpoint, because it's also an antimicrobial. And it prevents gram negative bacteria from growing. So it's been used over the years, wait, a long, long time ago, um, in sausage as a natural preservative. Remember, we have two artists that make gloves and long sleeves, long sleeve shirts. Otherwise, it's like harvesting fiberglass. My goats loved it. They weren't daunted by the fuzzy. The leaves are almost like Velcro, where it's that hook on. And so it does, they, they snag on you. I don't recommend feeding goats just to harvest your hops, but if you have goats, grow hops. <laughs> um, very well. Uh, oil from hops used to perfumes, beverages, mineral waters, tobacco. The Romans ate the young shoots like asparagus. And the extracted oils are used for flavorings and non alcoholic beverages, frozen dairy desserts, candy, bakers, gelatins, and puddings. Hops seeped in sherry make an excellent stomach cordial. These bar has been used to produce a fine brown dye. So it is really quite the, the multitasking herb. And it really has a lot of uses for it. The fact that it is um, prevents gram negative bacteria from growing always gets my attention. That's a pretty cool aspect from a medicinal standpoint or even a um, food safety standpoint. A lot of different varieties. I, I think they all grow well here. I, I think Want to get into growing hops? It's just kind of a matter of flavor that you're looking for. And the the people who brew their own beer are constantly looking for local growing hops. And for a while, hops was kind of the the plant that that people were looking at growing from a commercial plant standpoint. Sheridan. Research station had a whole area of hops. We used to do programs up there on growing hops. Then um, Dr. Curtis Swift over in Grand Junction had a hops area that he was growing. And it was really specific how you grow them and how you bring them down. CSU's got a whole area um, where they're growing hops. But there's a real demand for that product. 
Okay, yes, sir. Yeah, you can definitely sell your, your hops to the beer market. They're looking for you. You can sell it as a green one. The green is just the cones. There's a way to process it and make little pellets out of it. It's quite the, the specialty crop. It is called. So here's a or high soft, however you would try to pronounce it. Hardy perennial grows about two feet tall. And yeah, I have a I personally haven't found it long lived. Now for master gardeners who live in Cheyenne, they probably will, will contradict me and say it's been growing for 20 years. So so it depends on where you live. Okay. Again, grows in rather poor soils, the back alley soil. Most herbs want back alley soils. Uh, harvest the youngest leaves and stems as needed. Choose in the corners, sometimes as a um, condiment in the oil obtained from the leaves is used to make these plants. But when you love the leaves, they have just a really nice or to them. Lavender. There are a couple of places here in this area that are growing lavender. There was a big lavender farm up in Wheatland for a while, and then there were two, there were three lavender farms here in Cheyenne. And right now there's only one that I know of, and that's Mike Heath. And, and again, sometime this summer, I would like to do a field trip and take you guys out there to see how he's doing it and how his, his irrigation system. And he'll talk about his garlic and his hydroponics. And so it'll be quite the field trip. But there are some varieties that do better than other lavenders here. And he's growing one that's called Colgate. And then Munstead does well here. But you're looking really more at the folias for this. And lavender does not want to be old water. And you can kill your lavender by old water. It needs to be pruned. It naturally has to be pruned in order to keep it growing. The better it's pruned, the longer it will live. If you just let it grow scraggly, it's got a lifespan of only about five to seven years. But if you keep it pruned, you're looking at a 20 year plant. And so you take this here and you literally turn it into a ball. If you get a chance, there's a lavender fest in. Grand Junction Palisade area. And it's the latter part of June. Judy, have you been there? No. Yeah. A lot of fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And so you can tour all the different lavender farms. And, and every lavender farm has their own formula for how they grow and water the lavender. But predominantly, it's all on black plastic with drip irrigation system. But they'll all be, all those plants get pruned into a little brown ball, and that's just amazing. So a lot of uses for it, and don't overwater it. And there's some that do better than others. You always want to buy this as a whole plant or a start. Just trying to start them from seed, again, it's a perseverance. And it takes weeks, if not months, to get that seed to germinate. And once it germinates, it could take it a couple of years to actually flower. So faster gratification is to just buy it as a plant. You can mail order them. You can go to the Lavender Festival and buy them. <laughs> the Lavender Festival is a lot of fun. I, I dragged my husband to it. He didn't think it was fun, but you know, that's where it goes. Yeah, yeah. And and it's it's an interesting time because if they had the cherries were picked and it was was it apricots? I'm pretty sure it was apricots. Yeah. So it was it was a lot, it was fun. It was fun to go back there. And then there's the Lavender Growers Association. A lot of good information on that website. Kind of a cool group of people. But uh, if you decide to grow lavender, 
Well, again, go through the Richter's catalog and kind of educate yourself on what's out there. And then I can get you in touch with Mike Keith and he will give you a whole day's worth of information about it and, and tell you what's going best for him. And he's out in Burns. It's not very far from me. So he's out on the very phone level. Mint. So mint. Again, a really easy plant to grow, but this is this is the one that wants absolutely the opposite of what I've been telling you. This wants to grow in the shade, cool, moist soil. It wants water. It wants the shade. As soon as the sun hits it, it gets unhappy. If it gets hot and dry, it gets unhappy, and it will retreat back into the shade. So it's it's not going to be a plant that gets away from you in your on your property unless you grow it on the north side of your house. Um, if it gets into the lawn, as soon as it gets hot and dry, that's always going to take it off. So a lot of so it has kind of a bad rap, which I think is unfounded. And a lot of it comes from bad yeast because out here you're just not going to have to it. So I have a couple, I have like four different types of mint growing. I grow them in a little tiny narrow area about this wide. That's about this deep and underneath it's gravel. And it's right packed up against the north side of my cabin. And, and I get just enough sun over there that it's in the shade and it's kind of in the sun sometimes, but it's in a situation where it can't escape. It wants to, but it can't escape. Yeah. Is anyone growing mints? <coughs> so many different flavors. There's so many different flavors. Yeah. It's not like the house. I tried like the bombs and the mint, and they all like. So the the Menardia is a different creature, and that wants more sun. It wants some water. This wants shade and water. Happy in the shade. Yeah. So you just have to know where it's going to be happy. Where are you going to mint? No. Oh, okay. I'm like don't have a lot of outdoor stuff there. It just doesn't like, it doesn't like me. Yeah, for Shannon, chocolate mint is a fun one. And, and chocolate mint does grow here. It does taste like chocolate. And this is uh, Catherine. My mom accidentally mowed the mint, but it came back. And so I planted mint at my parents' house and it kind of crept out. She was in the shady area. It kind of crept out into the lawn. Every time my dad mowed, he's like, yeah, I was sleep clutch when I hit the mint. <laughs> <laughs> But it never went any farther. It just stayed right there. Okay. Broaden, well, broaden shade. And the more frequent the sprays are cut back, the better the growth. Leaves to be dried are best taken just as flowers begin to appear. So that's going to be the peak of flavor. Use the teas. So again, make your own tea with it. Um, oil from the plant juice and products such as chewing gum, confection, soap, and the pool. A lot of uses for it. I like to just put it in my water in the summer or my iced tea in the summer. A lot of different mints, domestic field mints, spearmint, peppermint, chocolate, Japanese, variegated, Swiss, banana, a mint called banana, ginger, grapefruit, orange, pineapple. And, and they all taste a little bit like they sound, the names imply. Grapefruit. Yeah, I think I Yeah, thank you. It's a myth that's native to Cuba. And so if, you're, if you get this drink, it's probably not the right mint for that drink. Unless they've imported them into Cuba. <laughs> okay, marijuana. So sweet marijuana, nice annual, stays small, compact, and it's not going to get away. Again, this is one that you can grow and harvest to make your own herb blend. 
but it, it pairs well with like hazel and some of the other words that we've talked about tonight. Very mild flavor, it doesn't really bring a lot to the party. Greek oregano. Now, a lot of times, so this is where it goes back to when you buy these herbs, make sure you're buying from a reputable source. If you're in the big box store and they're selling something like oregano, then make sure that it is, because a lot of times they'll sell you wild marijuana. And the wild marriage will get away and it becomes this giant mass of foliage. It does bloom, it does attract bees, and it's a great bee plant, wild marriage. But from a culinary standpoint, wild marriage just doesn't have anything to it. Pink flowers, again, it's great for bees. But Greek oregano, how many of you have eaten a raw Greek oregano leaf? You know it when you eat it because because it tingles. It makes your tongue tingle and buzz. That's oregano. That's the real deal. And, and so if it doesn't do anything when you chew on that leaf, it's most likely wild marijuana. So the oregano is gonna you you know it when you chew on it. It's gonna make your tongue kind of tingle. So there I am in the big black stores, right? <laughs> <laughs> Parsley, again, easy to grow, easy season to grow. Hardy biannual, we treat it as an annual leaves. Um, how the leaves can be curly, they can be straight, they can be flat, they can be big, they can be small, it's just kind of how much you want to grow. Relatively high in vitamin A and C and iron, so it's Eat your vegetables, it's good for you. You know that, that garnish that's on the side of the plank that everybody kind of ignores and goes, what kind of is this here? I don't think they do that a lot anymore, but that's, that's what it was for. I have fun salad. Rosemary, this is another one that's fun to grow. So rosemary. There's a lot of different rosemaries, and if you buy the rosemary at Christmas time and it's pruned into a little tree, it's not the culinary rosemary. And it's that it's that rosemary that you bring home, and, and five days later it's dead, and all the needles have fallen off of it. So rosemary is easy to grow in the garden. I would buy it as a started plant. Make sure that it's the culinary variety. Here it's only an annual. Like sunny locations, you can propagate it by cuttings or grown from seed. I like to use the leaves fresh. And a lot of times, rosemary will be used in a sensory garden. And, and especially for um, master, up until a couple of 2020, the master gardeners were going to stride, which is a, for kids with learning disabilities, for young kids. like like two and older to about what, six, something like that. And so we were doing a uh, sensory garden for them and helping them seed start. And, and so we were kind of helping them deal with all the, the sensory issues that they have. A lot of autistic kids, if, if any of you are familiar with stride, a lot of autistic kids, autistic kids don't like to touch dirt. They don't like to get their hands dirty. And so we would play with them long enough that we would actually get them to touch the soil. Get their hands dirty. Yeah, that was that's pretty tricky. I got some really we have some really good news for gardeners. How many of you use rosemary? Yeah. Anybody want a cutty? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Tony, this is just the ultimate thing. This is my favorite go-to, and you can add it and make your own herbal blend with rosemary and sky's the limit, really. Um, a lot of different types of rosemary. Some of them are more culinary than others. The, uh, the pine rosemary. So these are ones sold as little Christmas tree. Typically not suited for culinary use. A lot of different ones. Sage, salvia officialis. The salvia family is huge, absolutely huge. 
And out in California, this stuff grows wild, and they'll put their the beekeepers out there will put their bees in with the salvia and have a salvia plane. So we can grow a lot of different salvias here, and they're fairly long lived. They do well. They do well with either a lot of water or a little water, full sun, partial sun. So they're, they're pretty adaptive. And so the salvia that we're going to deal with is more of a culinary one. And again, this is one I like to buy already started. And typically don't start it from seeds. You can start it from seeds, but it just takes a while. And then it gets woody really fast. And so it's one that you need to pull out, get rid of, and start over with. But you can take cuttings. And, and get those cuttings ready and then restart it from your cuttings. But it's it's a plant that goes woody really fast. Been in a lot of different sages out there. I've got sages that are just used strictly for supporting bees and some sages that are used for culinary use. So has anyone grown stevia? Oh, worth growing. Absolutely worth growing. Easy to grow, full sun, a little hard to germinate, but not too bad. You guys are all master gardeners. You can <laughs> hard to germinate, should be daunting. It's about two feet tall. I grew mine in, in, in totally benign neglect, and it does well as neglected as a neglected plant. It does get about two feet tall. So when I harvested it, I just pulled it out, roots and all, cut the roots off because it gets to be a woody stem, and hung it upside down in my root cellar, let it dry, and then when I have my tea, so in the morning I'll just I'll just break a couple of the leaves off, throw them in the tea, add my add my tea, and then hot water, and then seep the whole thing together, and it's just naturally sweet, no calories. Naturally sweet without the calories. I like that. I wonder if it's anything is. So, very cool. Summer savory. So, there's a winter savory and a summer savory. The winter savory is a little bit more mild, maybe a little bit sweeter, but I think it's a little bit milder. Won't overwinter. Winter savory will overwinter. Worth growing. It's fine. As a, as a culinary herb. And again, it's another one that you can dry it and then blend it with some of your other herbs and, and make your own unique, you know, the, the Jason steak herb blend. Punch <laughs> yeah. tarragon. This one grows as a perennial with some protection. About two feet tall, multi branch. Kind of flat, long, plant slate shaped leaves. Likes to be in full sun, first to be on the dry side. Needs protection in the winter, so it doesn't like that winter wind. And this is one where when it's dried, you lose the flavor. So this is one where you could harvest it green and make a pesto. The pesto is going to have a little licorice flavor to it, but you know, you, again, you could make your own pesto blend. A little basil, tarragon, put some rosemary in there, a little olive oil, nuts of your favorite of your choice, right? Make your own pesto. This is another one that you can seep in vinegar, and so you can create your own salad dressing because the, the flavor does come out quite nicely in the vinegar. So when I use a vinegar to extract flavors for herbs, I use the plain white vinegar and not the apple cider vinegar. So apple cider vinegar has got a fungus in it. It's got that other, that word in there. And so you just want to use plain white vinegar. Probably use some of the Asian vinegars, the rice vinegars. Those would be it. So French cherry, and again, when you buy this, Make sure that you're getting the real deal. And in the big box stores, it's cheaper to sell the Russian tarragon, which can be started from seeds. Your tarragon has got to be started from stem cuttings. 
So again, if you taste properly, it's you'll know immediately if it's Russian or Tarot or the French, because the Russian has no flavor to it. Yep. And the Russian blooms and it has a white blossom on it. So if you start, if you see the French cherubin doesn't bloom and it can't be obviously can't be started for seeds, so it's started for cuttings. And so buy from a reputable nursery. Um, but find someone that's got that will give you a cutting. Fine. Easy to grow. Who's is anyone in here growing any thyme? Thyme is easy to grow. And it's, it's kind of fiddly to harvest. Little tiny leaves. Look at, I mean, they're tiny. They're, they're, they fit on a, an eraser head and still leave you room. And so they're, they're difficult to harvest. And so I usually just start at the top and just sort of zip them off. And, and then I dry them and I store them in an airtight lid. But again, you can make your own herb blends with this. You can make the, the Tom's salad blend works. <laughs> so thyme comes in a lot of different flavors. And we've got that one called Magic Carpet. I don't think that's really a, an edible one, but from the culinary group is English, compact, French, caraway, peeping, oregano, Portuguese. And the list goes on. And then there's a lemon, a lime, and orange. So, so you could really have a lot of fun with the different flavors. And so again, they, they taste like the name implies. They're easy to grow. I've got some growing in full sun. I've got some growing in full shade. And some get a lot of water. Another one gets very little water. And, and so they're pretty adaptive. But again, back alley soil, don't fertilize it because you lose the flavor. They're not ever going to get very big. My biggest one might might be eight inches. So it's not going to get much bigger than that. Sweet woodruff. This is another just beautiful spring blooming herb. And it works really well in a rock garden. Tracks little bees, little native bees, just love this one. And this is an herb that grows best in partial shade, partial sun. So it doesn't like it real hot. Does like a fair amount of water, but this is one that's used in uh, to flavor a German a German white wine called May wine. It has a very nice little flavor to it. It's very subtle, but it's a pretty plant. Likes it cool and moist. When the plant's crushed, it has a sweet scent, similar to freshly mown hay and vanilla. So all these herbs need good air circulation, well-grained soil, soil pH around six and a half to seven, a couple exceptions. Most of them are adaptive. Back alley soil. Keep it, don't even, I don't fertilize. I don't fertilize them at all. Not, not even with my alfalfa tea. Um, keep consistent with the water. Containers and then mulch you have to protect them, of course. And of course, yep. So let's let's take a break. We took about a 10 minute break.
So what kind of biological source is this sunshine? <laughs> I'm not a vital person, but I really wanted to take that service girl across the room. <laughs> I know, and even when I was in my sitting back in the book, I couldn't do that. <laughs> the bride was like, I'm not touching that. <laughs> yeah, and it was such an ancient service girl. Oh, that was pretty good. Yeah, I still find it in my life. Yeah, I think that's what it's going to be. Thank you. 
just jump back briefly to birds again. And there, Purdue is doing some interesting research on thyme and oregano. And they've discovered that thyme and oregano possess an anti-cancer compound that suppresses tumor development. But adding more to your tomato sauce isn't enough to gain significant benefit. It's going to have to be like a lot. But um, I thought it was kind of interesting that you know, the more they work with her, the more they, they do research with it, the more they find out about it. So I'll just pass this around to you guys. Um, 
So this is actually a pretty short segment. When I took irrigation in college, there was a whole semester. We were just so focused on what the new theorem was all on pressure. And so when you do a, an irrigation system, you really work from the, the worst case scenario. So when you do an irrigation system, so I'm going to kind of use what, what I do in the vegetable garden. So my main line comes in here, and then I have laterals coming off like this. There's a valve. And for a long time, I was chosen 40 foot long lines. And so your worst case scenario is always the last to end. And so the, you have to have enough water so that if this is half a gallon, half a gallon per hour, you want to make sure you're getting that half a gallon per hour down there. So what you send in through here is going to meet the needs of down there at the very end. And, and I think that's great information for installing lawn sprinkler systems, but for the rest of us, it's kind of like, well, that's nice. Whatever. <laughs> but we won't, we won't mess around with that. But we will talk about how to put one together. Does anyone put a drip irrigation system together? So from Jim, uh, what is the best way to irrigate mature pine and spruce trees, drip irrigation, sprinkler, sulfur hose, or other? So really the best way, the most, and that's what that's what drip irrigation is all about. It's it's saves water. And it puts water exactly where you want it. So when you use a, a oscillating sprinkler. Throws the water all over the place. You're easily losing 40 to 60 percent just to the wind blowing away. You're losing water to just evaporation. You're putting it on the leaves, and it has to drip off the leaves and try to make its way to the ground. You might get 20 percent of that initial what you're throwing up in the air that actually makes it to where it needs to be. So a sprinkler system is really only good for lawns when it pop up and or, you know, get the, so I've been doing irrigation for a long time. When I got out of college, this first thing I did for the first year was irrigation systems for residential use. And so when you get a whole bunch of people that do irrigation together, they make all the appropriate noises. You know that, the one goes, Shh, sh, 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 sh. <laughs> <laughs> who knew, who knew, right? I come out of college and I, I learned how to make that noise. It's really useful. Um, we're, we're trying to save water. We're trying to be very precise and use precision irrigation and safer water. And, and that's what drip allows us to do. It puts the water at the roots. And so for those of you who helped at the farm and ranch show, you probably just were dreaming or talking in your sleep about, yeah, drip irrigation, don't throw it in the air, put it at the roots. And so, Water, especially when you live in Cheyenne, the water is expensive. And you want to have a vegetable garden, you want to do that homesteading, raise your own food, put up your own food, and but you don't want to have to pay more for it than what you would at the grocery store. And so one of those ways to keep the cost down is to keep your water where it belongs. Now on drip irrigation with a vegetable garden, the city's a lot more lenient and they'll let you water later in the morning. And, and so when you water your vegetable garden, it's best to water late in the morning, early afternoon, but you don't want to water your vegetable garden 
early in the morning before the sun rises because the plants aren't ready for water. So vegetables are a little weird about that. Vegetables want to warm up first and then get their water. And tomatoes are the worst, but they're also the best at showing you that the water's got to be done in the, when they're warm. So if you've ever had tomatoes, you're looking at that beautiful tomato and it gets those cracks on it or it splits. It's because it's water too early in the morning and it's too cold. So that skin has got to be warmed up when you start to water. Tomatoes also don't want water in their leaves. Peppers don't want water in their leaves. Herbs don't want water in their leaves. So that's where this, the beauty of this comes in. A lot of different ways to do it, a lot of different tools to do it, a lot of different ways to set it up. And I usually, my system's just dead end. So I, I get the water in here, I get the whole system pressurized. I don't have a return flow on it. And I just fold them over. And uh, Charles, who was it? I think it was Charles, was telling me that he just takes a little half inch PVC, he rolls the ends, and I'll show you how to do that when we roll this out. And then you squeeze it and put it in there. And it's like, oh, that's pretty, pretty fast. But you can also have that water time so it matches your soil. And so the soil can be kind of a tricky part of it. So let's okay. So know your soil type. I thought I had a picture in here. So know your soil type. So I am on a really sandy, coarse soil. So I'm, I'm down here. And so my wetting profile is going to be pretty straight down. But when you start getting on a medium soil, that's when it's got some clay in it, holds water a little bit better, it spreads out. And your clay soils, which are, are referred to as fine soils, and it's because those clay particles, remember, are really small and, and they're like plates. They're stacked up on top of each other, where sand is just big chunks, and then you get the medium soil, which is something in between. So your, your fine soils, your water profile is going to be more out than down. This will take a little bit longer. This is, um, it, it's going to take longer to get the water where you want it to the depth you need it. Sorry. Right. This is a closed loop system, this picture here. I, I don't necessarily like to do those. I would prefer to do a, a system that's kind of a, a dead end loop because I think it's a little more versatile and it's not gonna use as much equipment to do that. So all, everything I do is a dead end system where it just, the whole system charges, it dead ends or it dead ends and and I think I can maintain and know exactly, I can keep track of the water that it leaks out better. Okay, know your water pressure. Mm -hmm. yeah, know your water pressure. Mm -hmm. Typically in Cheyenne, your water pressure is in right around 45 psi, should be about 45 psi coming out of the whole ship. Pressure reducer, really, really important. Otherwise, you will blow out your drip irrigation system, too much pressure in there, and you, you create a water feature or many water features in your landscape. And this is a flat soaker hose. And the flat soaker hose, or even the round soaker hose, are really susceptible to too much pressure, too. And you'll know it because. You'll, you'll walk out one day and you'll see this big long stream of water coming out. And it's just too much water pressure going through it. These are not very expensive. So I handed out the Dripworks catalog. And so it, the equipment's not expensive at all. And I got this drip kit out of this catalog. There's another, this isn't the only place to buy this stuff, but 
quite a different prediction over the years, so I'm a little biased. A lot of different fittings. Apologize, I could be a little more organized here. Okay. H21. This will sit you back about $13, maybe 12, but it will save you a lot of headaches if, if you get too much pressure, especially these guys here, you know, any of these are pretty sensitive to it. And so it will save you a lot of headaches by not blowing out your systems. Not very expensive, but definitely worth it. Um, so water quality, <clears throat> I'm out in the county, I'm on a well. I've got pretty decent water, I've had it tested. And however, I'm on sand. And so I need a filter. So filters come in a couple of different shapes and sizes. Again, they're not real expensive and I probably get one that's a little smaller. Um, so on page, 18, about $15. So this is a 200 mil mesh filter. You can pull it apart, clean it out, or this is pretty cool. You can just pull this valve and just blow it all out. Or you can even attach, and attach another hose to this and just bypass it all or just direct filter it. Very handy to have. So. These two together are a must have. Now, if one can pull up one of these guys, there's permanently fall. So I'm going to pass this around. And the emitters are about every 12 inches on this one. So there's an emitter and there's an emitter. So it's just so these are control a controlled leak, and this is controlled leak at about half a gallon an hour. I don't recommend this particular your plate gets too light. I want to have at least a 10 or 12 mil your tape, and this one is this is 15 mil. This is tough, it's hardy, it's durable, it's durable. It will not withstand a lawnmower, but other than that, it's that's how I know that one. <laughs> or you pull. Yeah. Is there a way to calculate, like on your drawing there, what pressure you need at the head and what pressure will be delivered at the end of the line so that when you think you, when you have your pressure reducers, you don't over reduce. So you still get flow at the end. Yeah, you can certainly go through that. There's a way of doing it. Oh, there's a way of doing it. Absolutely. Um, I, I, even though I know the math and how to do it, it's, it's, I don't. I just measure what comes out of that worst case scenario. And that's what I go by. Yeah, because you can jump through all the math on that for sure. Um, so back to the filter question. So I'm handing that drip tape around. The emitters are tiny. And this is what happens when you do a, a home and or a show and then everything gets split. Sorry about that. It's in another box in a different location. So the drip emitters, they're, they're a channel. And the water goes through this maze and then it pops out through this little slit. So the water comes in it goes through this, and so it's metered out at half a gallon. So 
And if that gets clogged, you can't unclog it. It's permanent, permanently stuck. These are inexpensive enough that I have them all over the place. Every new zone I have gets one of these. I have a whole house filter. I don't trust it. I don't have problems even though I'm sand. But, but I'm not going to know if one of those emitters gets clogged until it's too late. The plant dies. And again, I do big gardens. And so I'm monitoring every little part of its part. If something dies, I know I've got a problem. But these are cheap enough. I put them on every place. Every zone, every zone has got one of these. And so I probably have eight of these. Yeah. So, and they last forever. I, I have just they're 16 years old and still working. The filter gets a little weird, but you can replace the filter. And then I'll take the filter out. Can't do it on this one. But I'll take the filter out and I just soak it in vinegar. Cleans it out right away. Yeah, so this comes out, this is an older model. This comes out and it just like it stands in. Okay. I pass these two. You already you really know how to do this. <laughs> I don't have anything this sophisticated, though. Yeah, yeah. There. So once once an emitter gets clogged, it's you just can't undo it. This one. So here's an emitter that I cut. You can see here's where that emitter comes out and. You can see how fine that is if that got some sand in there. That fog. So this is. Again, I apologize for this. The company's been sold and bought a couple times. And, and this is the old Netafilm. I actually call it Netafilm. In here? Yeah. And so this is, this is ideal for irrigating your trees. You can see it's not very big, and it's this far. It's, it's from the Netafilm. Okay, so it's still called Netafilm. It was John Deere water for a while, and it was something else for a while. I'm glad it's back to Netafilm. So back to Jim's question about the best way to water the trees. You know, if you've got a lot of them, I would use this, and it's got emitters. It looks like about every 12 inches. You can get it farther apart, but I would I would do a circle of this. I don't know if you guys can see the chalkboard or not. And around a tree, if this is my trunk right here, I would come out and I would do a circle. I'd connect it, connect it, I'd do another circle. And depending upon the size of the tree, I would probably do a third circle. And then I'd have it all teed in. See the intersection right here. And then you can keep on running it to another tree. But it just depends on how much time and effort you want to put into it. Or you can just take the garden hose and drop it underneath there in water. Okay, filtration drip emitters. Okay, um, so a lot of 
landscapers, a lot of irrigation installers are not necessarily plant people. Just because they're landscapers doesn't mean that they're actually plant people. It means that they know how to install this and dig a big hole. Sorry, taking on my own field. I do not like spaghetti tubing unless you don't have any other choice. Because even though <laughs> Even though they've got little emitters and it's, you know, this is a one gallon an hour emitter that I popped in there. You actually don't know that there's one gallon every hour coming out of the end of this. This is a little attachment that keeps bugs from crawling in there. And so you, you risk having a critter crawl in there and making it a hole and clogging it. So you gotta go around and check these. And so I don't, I don't like emitters and I don't believe that they're gonna give you a gallon an hour. And if they're, the longer they are, the less likely you are to get that gallon an hour. And here's one that's got pinched to go down. And I've got different emitters here. And they each one have a different gallonage per hour. So you really have to know what the ultimate <coughs> goal is for that plant. And so a lot of, I see a lot of people plant, you know, do the conservation easement bit. And they put one gallon an hour on there. It's like, really? So you've got to run that forever so that tree can get the right gallonage. And it's hard on the pump, hard on the well. And you're never sure if you're getting the right gallonage per hour to that tree. And so if we go back to the Rule of thumb for watering the tree. And so for every inch of trunk diameter equals 10 gallons of water. If you put a one gallon an hour emitter on there and your trunk diameter is already an inch. How long do you have to run that well in order to get that tree that water it needs? Yeah, I mean that's that's and I and I get this kick, I get this pushback of the water is free. Well, your electric bill isn't, <laughs> and so you may have to pump that water, and especially the newer homes because your wells are deeper, you might be pumping that water up 600 feet. Well, your your electric bill is going to reflect that. So put on the biggest emitters you can find for your trees so that you know you're getting them enough water, but you're not running the pump. Because again, those of us who live on wells, the only time your well pump will go out is in a blizzard or at Christmas. Yeah. Well, you have a house full of family. Exactly. Yeah, a house full of family, and, and inevitably they're either elderly or really or toddlers yeah so 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 that from those 10 gallons of water how often once a week really yes that's monstrous yes the trees need a lot of water especially when they're young they really need a lot of water and i don't think trees ever really become established here but the water needs are, are ginormous, absolutely ginormous. So, yep, yep, yep. No. So again, the, the little, I, and I do like this. Just you know, count up all the emitters and you wrap them around your tree, and so you've got maybe twenty emitters, and they're a gallon an hour. Well, you only have to run it for an hour, maybe two hours. So it's, it's a lot more efficient, a lot less time to pump. Okay. So the little emitters that are being handed around, not, not real fond of doable, but you gotta really kind of micromanage. I'm I'm more lazy. I like to plant stuff and then put this stuff down. This again is that metafilm. Uh, put on center, you can wrap this around to your flower garden and 
snaking all over the place. Okay. This stuff is easy to do to install your own emitters and drip. And we'll, we'll open this up and we'll play with this and we'll, and we'll do some attachments. We'll kind of put it together. Mm -hmm. It helps to know where your hose bed is and know what the correct is. And they make just a little inexpensive gauge that you can attach and turn your hose bib on and it'll tell you right away what your pressure is. Not very expensive. Yeah, water filtration must have. Yeah. And I'm just I'm just paranoid enough about my with my drip getting clogged that I cut filters all over the place. Different emitters to increase different challenges per hour. And this is what they look like when they're installed inside the, the metal film or the, the drip irrigation. I mean, it's kind of it's really kind of cool technology how we channel that water and make that water go through and move it out. And know your soil. I'm not really big on a dead end system. We can get we can get really really detailed in this. This is part of you know you were asking the question about knowing the, and and there's actually more elegant math to figure this out. So if they're if you're trying to three inches, six inches, or nine inches deep, and your emitter spacing is 12 inches and you got a half a gallon per hour. Run it for 30 minutes. So if you're trying to get deeper, anywhere from 37 minutes to nine minutes, depending upon what your soil is soil is like. So you can figure it out. There's and if you want this lecture or this chart, I can totally give it to you. I don't want to make you crazy with me now. Format, no spacing. So the, the trick is here. So this is a pretty short lecture. I do this primarily for my vegetable garden. So this is my system here, and I have little valves. It's all PVC, and I've got valves. I saw a valve. I know I have great breath for you. So I've got everything in PVC, and so I've got the, the male and the female fitting, and then I just have a little, a little valve or a little manifold, and these are just cranky. They won't get up. Just try to turn. So I get a pliers out and I turn them with the pliers because get thick. But this is this is just really easy on and off. But it, it turns. It's now it's now tight. So I just like unscrewed it and I'm but it's just it's counterintuitive. What you want to do? But it's oh gosh, it's it will save me so much time and effort and energy. And I put this down, um, the strike side goes up. The emitters are every, looks like every 10 inches on this. So I can do some very efficient irrigation with that. And when I put my drip down, I can now grow more plants in less space. So here's my little valve, the PVC. And I've got emitters every 10 inches. I know that my wetting pattern is going to be like this. I'm actually going to have some nice overlap. I'm going to put a plant here. I'm going to put one over here, especially with my peppers. I'm I pack those guys in close together. So they're they're maybe a foot apart. If I do corn, I've got a corn plant here, and here, and here. So I, I will plant on either side of that drip tape all the way down and 
that'll be a foot apart, maybe distance, and then four inches apart. So I pack the corn in, but I can grow more in less space using the drip irrigation system than I can if I was doing like an overhead sprinkler or hand watering. So the water is going right to the roots. And then to make my life even easier because I hate weeding. Uh, how many people like to weed? Raise your hand. <laughs> you come to my house. So again, I will put black plastic over the top of my irrigation system. And now, now the water stays put. So I don't even have a lot of soil evaporation with water. I just cut a hole. I just cut it, usually I cut a little square. And I put my plants in the middle of that, especially winter squash, peppers, tomatoes, eggplant, cucumbers, watermelon, and my plant goes right in the middle. So now I'm not weeding, water isn't evaporating. Warm soil, remember tomatoes, peppers, all those guys want your soil about 85 degrees. And they and these guys don't want water on their leaves. They just don't want water. And I realize that now yeah, rains and rains gonna get water on leaves. I don't worry a lot about that, but I can save my water and conserve my water by this method. This is just how I want to do it. And then timers. All these systems should have a timer. And the timers come in different shapes, flavors, sizes, money. I use a rainbird timer. And I can put like 20 zones on there. What was I thinking? <laughs> I know what I was thinking. They all have the same time. And they're easy to do, they're easy to program. And uh, this is coming from someone who is not a technology person. Um, this part has little holes in your black plastic tubing. So this. So I'm sure this little instrument has saved a lot of people from going to the emergency room because they, yeah. Um, yeah, you use a drill, go through, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you Where just, did you get that? That, that was wonderful. Oh, oh my God, that's so easy. I'm gonna put this in my pocket. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, one of my boxes. Yeah. So the tool, the um, the drip kit here comes with a little hole punch, punch holes in it. So we'll, we'll try to put that too. Yeah. And it's so easy. It's so easy. Yeah. I've heard so many horror stories about guys taking the drill out, taking the black plastic, and ooh, the hands. Oh, yeah. There are some that are just this. This one's okay. It's okay, but it's really easy to still slip and go through your hand. It just you just don't go as deep. <laughs> That's on page six. Yeah, but there's some. Um, yeah, Christy, did you find where the punch little punch thing is on page six? Yeah, this is a must must have. Yeah, a lot of different hole punches. Fifteen dollars will save you a trip to the emergency room. <laughs> and there's a couple different varieties. You can get cheaper. Seven dollars is what's in the kit. What page are you on? Sixteen. Page sixteen. Yeah. So some. So again, you, you guys are, are becoming master gardeners, so it's okay to be a geeky master gardener and and read the Dripworks catalog. At bedtime. <laughs> oh, yeah, look at this. Yeah, I need one of those. And I, I need a filter. Can get really fancy and expensive? And, and yeah, you definitely need some pressure reducers. Those are must have on a drip irrigation system. And 
It's not nearly as much fun as going into a, a, a sort of specialized with the irrigation and being able to stand there and, and look at the systems and, and pick and choose and fly off the shelf. But it's still, let's see. So on page five and page four is where they've got the drip kits. So you can get a drip kit to fit your vegetable garden. You can also keep the whole thing together, which is what I do. I don't use mainline tubing, I use PVC. And it's just easier for me to work with than the vegetable garden because it tends to be big. And, and then on page 12, is the actual drip kit. So this is in page 12 is the drip kit for this. 15 mil, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go lighter. I know that 15 mil is a little bit more pricey, but this my 15 mil tape has now lasted me for 50, for like 16 years. I have a lot of filters. And so it's not oh yeah, I know. It doesn't like to get bent. That's, that's probably one of the downsides of this. So when you roll it out, you need two people to help you roll it out. You don't want to kink it. Um, I have some pink stuff in here someplace. So you don't, yeah, right back there. Yeah. Yeah, Tyler's got some of the pink. When it kinks, you essentially break it. You get that break becomes a leak. Yeah, that is a way it makes such a great demo. So you can see where it's, it's been bent enough times and it's that, that pinch point right there, right there is a, a little hole and so it'll leak. So when I, at the end of the season, I just drag it all and I pinch, oh, I pinch, I don't want to go away. <laughs> so kinking it, means that you're going to have a little hole eventually right there. In the spring, when you haul this stuff up, again, I just lay it out flat. I don't try to roll it or fold it or do anything. I just lay it, lay it flat, flat near my garden. You need to run it with the ends open because I guarantee you there's going to be little bugs that have wanted to live in here. And so you got to blow out the bugs first before you can seal the end. And, and the kit here, so what I do with the ends is I just fold it over a couple times and then I just take twine or something and I wrap it. What Charles was telling me was to take a PVC, like a one inch PVC, and then you, you fold it over once and then you fold it again like this. And you take that PVC cup and you drop it over the top of this to hold it. And that way it doesn't spring open and become a water feature, but that's just how you, you close off that end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they've got all sorts of different ways in the catalog for, and yeah, they've got the cake and plug for 50 cents. I need those. So I like that, that either tie it down or PVC it. And I can spray paint the PVC like some annoying color like Hunter Safety Orange and not lose it. <laughs> I would still lose it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But so there's a lot of ways to tie those in. Okay. So what is your design? Have have a garden plan. I have, I'm not a big fancy, you know, the garden circle here or triangle over here. I am just your straight line row crop type vegetable gardener. So I have a tendency to go that way because it's easier. I have some fixes it when I run it over to one more. I put it to the keep it simple. Um, you told us about growing potatoes. You put your drip line underground. Yep. Do these tolerate?
tolerate that? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. So potatoes. So, so all my vegetables, when I grow them, have a benchmark of what they need to get back to me. So potatoes for every, and it's, the number 10 is pretty prevalent here. So every pound of potato that you plant, you should get 10 pounds back. So. And that's the beauty of this rib cake, and you can start to achieve those, those benchmark numbers. So on your potatoes, you're going to dig a trench like that. And I usually put just a little bit of soil back in. And you can take your seed potato, and you can start those in trays. And and so like a 10, 20 tray, get the soil in there and get them growing. And so I'll take my seed potato out with the roots and I will put it, I will put my drip tape down here and a little bit more soil. This really isn't as fiddly as it sounds. And then I'll put my seed potato here so that the water, so here's my potato. Starting to grow. It's got roots. And my water is right underneath it. Potatoes are water thirsty, like pigs, water thirsty pigs. Huge water. So I will take my drip tape, and this is the only time you do it upside down. And so if you get the ones that's got the, the little seams that say this is the right side, you just take it and you turn it upside down. So you turn it upside down. And that way, when you turn it off, the water drains downward. If you have it this way, you'll suck in fines. So it will clog your emitters. So it's got to be down like this versus under the black plastic, it's up. So only for potatoes you go down, everything else is up. So you should be getting <coughs> 10 pounds of potatoes for every pound you plant. Okay. And and I think that's like that's a benchmark number. So that's what you so everything that comes out of your vegetable garden you should weigh or count. Oh, all the peppers that come up. I weigh all the potatoes and the tomatoes and everything. So I know if I'm making my numbers, I know if that plant is making the numbers it should be making. So I'm not going to go to all this work and have something underperform. And I usually put, I usually mend the soil for my potatoes first. And, and then I bury them because I'm only going to fertilize them once. And so I use a lot of alfalfa pellets. And as they grow, of course, you're going to mound them and keep mounding, keep mounding. Keep mounding. And so from here, this produces the, the tubers. And you want this soil here fluffy. Very light and fluffy. But I'll have amended the soil in this zone first. So this is what gets my um, my fish emulsion, my alfalfa pellets, whatever else. Maybe a little soil salt left down in there. Okay. Bottom of my purse, I kind of. Okay. Like most women's purses, it's like <laughs> bottomless, right? <laughs> it's a very popular. Oh, yeah. I might have a small purse on purpose. Although I know women, some women will carry um, foot army knives with them, you know, the kind that's got. 
spoons and forks on them and forks for this. And But the black plastic, I like to lay it out in the sun. So I like to lay this tubing in the sun so it warms up and, and it's a lot happier to work with. Working with a coal, it's um, not quite as happy. And then timers, in order to really get the best production out of a vegetable garden, you really need a timer. So this is the timer that comes with this system that male and female end on it. It's easy to, looks like it's pretty easy to program. It takes a nine volt battery. So it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Your best employee. And this is what's going to give you your best yields too. It comes on, it turns off. I turn the hydrant on and I walk away and I do 10 other chores and go, you know, come back and everything's floating. So this is, and tomatoes want the water consistent. They want it water at 11 in the morning, they want it 11 in the morning regardless. So this is 50 feet of tubing, of the black plastic tubing. So this is where I'm going to have you guys come on up because at this point we'll work hands on them. And so when you when you pull this out, so the tunnel wants to come that way, but slowly. So I don't, I also don't, and I think I'm going to give you the other end. And again, I want you to walk out really slowly. And, and so it doesn't kink. And you might have to uncurl it as you're going. Because you want, once this kinks, you now have a water feature. It breaks at that point. And then they give you little tubes. So guys, so everyone, I'm moving the owl. I'm sorry for making you motion sick. <laughs> um, I'm gonna try to do it here as best I can. If I can't, we'll go in the hallway. I'm gonna see what I can do with these two on the Now in this drip kit, this is a little, again, this is a little different than what I do at home, but that's okay. The best public instructions, they have <laughs> Yeah. You have your landscape staples, and you need to use these because as the drip tape gets contracts, it'll it does all sorts of things. It'll curl up, it'll hop over, it'll move around. So these make it stay in place. This is the little end doodad, and so. You've done irrigation before. Who hasn't done irrigation? Oh, okay. I have. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, Constance, I'm going to have you put the end on. Uh -oh. to, yeah. <laughs> so, this is pretty easy. And, and so, you take it and you just run it through like this, and you fold it over and you run it through the other side. So, you pinch it. Okay. 
So it's pretty straightforward, pretty easy. And, and now you just close the loop. So that's pretty easy. So this, you just ran it over with the lawnmower. You see what you fix it with, okay? Now this end, okay, who else has it done for this issue? This, this one, especially. I'll put this one on here so that you can take the whole So, yeah, so what I do is I don't really want to And I can pull it, I just board it up. And if you're outside in a hurry, you can do it this way, or you can take uh, a mat or a lighter. Just go underneath it and just warm it up carefully. And just warm it up in my hands and you press it with it and you can push it on. Oh, so let's do that. So it's something that sits on the hose. So then when you roll this out, you want to keep you want to try not to kink it hard to do. It's normally going to go out. Grab the long box and you can run. Does anyone have a pocket knife to sharpen it in their mouth? Okay, I'm going to have you hold this and we'll roll it out again. So I'm going to have you guys all attach this. I can go with what I think might be for this. Let me just put it on the size. You want to make you want to play this one. Let's see if this works a little bit better. <laughs> I, I live on the give blood daily ranch, so I'm at the point where I grab that wrap and that's it. <laughs> baking. Cornstarch and baking sort of go a long way. Yeah. <laughs> so my nurse is in there going, oh. And I'm not a nurse tonight. I have hung the IV bags from curtain rods from. Whatever. Okay, so I've got like four of them. So I'd like to try to hand it attaching this to to the hard plastic. Like, okay. So what is my little punch? My little punch. So the trick with this now is you want to, and this can be a little bit difficult because the plastic's a little on the cold side. So when you punch this in, you're you've got this laid out right. It's flat on the ground, and you've got you've got the plan. And, and the trick is to make sure that you push this in. So that when this goes in, everything's flat. Because it's real easy to push a hole in and all of a sudden this has got to go straight up like that. So you want it to go in thusly. Not I've only got to turn it a little bit. 
So nice pop. And this guy is that going there. And I wiggle it around to make sure I've got good contact in there, good connection. So what is it? We'll go. And this looks like about better. So we'll, we'll try to do about two feet. So put put a hole in there and you're going to attach that. Okay. Now I'm going to have you also when you've got one. So I want you to attach that to this, but I want you to make sure that you're putting it so that it's your emitter side. Now it helps to get a hold of the end to push it over. Okay. It's hard really to do that. Okay, so now it's it's kind of calm, so I have to have you attach that. So again, it's kind of calm. Let's see what happened on this. So you've got this rolled all the way to the back, and you've got to work along. And then you twist it to go that way. And that way you lock it in the position. Who wants to try to win? Oh. <laughs> so the tool, so grab the tool. And you put one on top here. And then one right here. And then that. This is the <laughs> Yeah, so the, the one, let's fix it because we ran it over the lawnmower. <laughs> Sorry, no. 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 So again, it's the same thing as if you just slip it on here and slip it on there, and then you want it just all the way back, and then you try to go that way. So these are the little arm things. So the whole idea behind these ends, you see we've got the little um, hook on or the uh, oval. So you put this on and you tighten it down. You try to take it down. And then that way you can take and, and stake it down mm -hmm. so that it's not jumping and moving all over the place. Because you really want it to do it. Normally, oh yes, here it is. This is really important. These are goof plugs. <laughs> this is, oops, I put it in the wrong place. And so you pull it out and with the tool, with this tool, you then take one of these goof plugs. So the pointy side goes in, right? And so you just take this over the top of it and push it in. So so it's like, oops, that's not where I wanted it. Or, oops, I don't need a, a line there anymore. So I've got a goof plug that plugs up that hole. So who wants to go next? Chrissy. So again, we'll get it sort of laid into as flat as possible. Well, you figure out where the side is and then you can roll it so that it's the top. And if you make a mistake, you have two plugs. That's a very wonderful way to we're not all watching you. We're not all watching you. Yeah, you heard it pop and then it's much better. And anyone else want to put a hole in there? Everyone's good? Okay. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Does it seem a lot easier? Mm -hmm. Yeah.
I, I like PVC to it's have a any slot B and I can go to the crater. But this is also a lot more flexibility to it. You can now do circles, you can go around, do serpentines. So it's it's a lot more flexible in your design. And you will need these, hold everything down. Those are easy to use. This is just one design, one option. Questions, thoughts, comments, comments. Yeah. So this, this is half inch tubing. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. And so when you get your PVC, you have to get a coupling to accommodate this. Yeah. 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 It involves a lot more parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A little saw. And... Do you ever Yeah, trying to figure out why I I have tubing where it's it's like oh, I don't want to pull off. Mm -hmm. so I yank the whole thing out and I either cut that off and cut a new or shorter and then replace it. But that's why I'm just so wrong with those filters. It's just insurance. So is this an end plug for this? That's an end plug. And it's it's kind of a trick design because like I said, these things expand and contract. It gets hot out and expands, and then you come out in the morning and they're all picked up and they're going different directions. That just helps keep it in one place. You can stake it down with one of these guys. I've seen bungee cords used, I've seen all sorts of fun things. You get, you get pretty creative. There's, there's no rules or regulations on how you do it as long as whatever you do works for you. Instructions. <laughs> no, but there's a YouTube video out there. Yeah, good. Thank you. Not one should be sticking the candy in here. Matt. Woohoo! Get that at the grip kit. Yeah. Some of us are like, wait. <laughs> <laughs> So that's my lecture for tonight. Thank you. You guys have to sleep a little bit early. Well, let's see. Where's the box? Tonight, I'm starting to come back. Where do you want some of these? Just a little bit, and 
Thank you. 